out of out of the ed yeah. fund. Well, you know, when we say fifteen projects of a million and a half, they're they're all not going to be a million and a half. I think Westford was eight hundred thousand, for instance, and that's over a five year period. Uh, and so um, there are still some caps, which Graham could talk about in the overall TIF funding and. Okay, uh, these would be paid back in five years, not in the life of the bond for 20? No, I, I didn't say that. I said the life of the pilot is for five years. So those 15 projects may be three projects a year. So it's not like there's 15 coming in every year. The administration- Okay, but, but they, they would be funded out of the ed fund for the life of the bond, which is right. generally 20 years. Right, but- yeah. Okay. Think, the scale, the way I like to think about it is, let, let's assume you had 15 at $1 million just to be round. I think that's still pretty high. Yeah. That's $15 million compared to what we see in a lot of our TIF districts. So over five years, you could cover 15 municipalities, which is probably comparable to what one TIF district might be. Uh, the administration, you know, this is their initiative um the governor had a press conference on it he was very high on it uh to get to some help economic development help to these small towns okay senator pearson um senator sorokin how, how do we you know the the theory behind our standard TIF districts is they elevate the property value uh, right in that neighborhood and therefore in the at the end of the payback period the uh, property the grand list is inflated and for the ed fund benefits etc taking the example of Westford which obviously I represent along with you so I'm interested in helping them why would we think a water investment in water district would would oh, promote would. development i mean there there is that holding back development i i, I just want to understand if if we're we're i understand the idea to have flexibility for smaller towns and smaller communities i'm on i want to know are we still believing the same premise holds with these kinds of tiffs that overall over time uh, it will uh, ab absolutely uh, and in town of Westford, they brought in schematics and a lot of plans. And without this wastewater district, this uh, a few blocks around the center of town would not be developed without them having access to the wastewater treatment plant. Well, I know we didn't get to put... I have to say, Senator Ballant, you have to change that picture because I'm having trouble talking with you peering at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> Quizzically. That's her. What do you mean the dog eats your homework? That's a better picture. <laughs> she and Senator unmute McDonald yourself. Yeah, have, you unmute yourself. Should have uh, comparisons <laughs> on there. The dog ate your homework look. Right. Okay, but the. So I think we understand that tips <laughs> can't go there for. <laughs> really they're complex enough financing that you really have to have a finance and a planning department and smaller towns don't. I know East Montpelier could not put up senior housing downtown for the lack of a septic system. Right. And that if they could put in a septic system, it would open up more land in their downtown area for, um, you know, uh, for development. Um, I'm sure there are other small towns that are there. I'm just wondering, but when you usually do a TIF district, you have a project. You know, this hotel wants to go up, this building, this facility, this company, and the, the value to the grand list will be that. But if, but there's a specific project. Do, the, do these smaller towns have to have a specific project or just say, if we build it, um, 
they will come. Um, I, I'm i not 100% sure. It's been a while. I know Westford, yeah. I know Westford, which was the one that came into our committee in detail, did have uh, multiple uh, prospective tenants and builders uh, for their block, where it's their several block area around uh, the town center. So they, they were able to show that um, if you did the infrastructure, it would benefit the grand list. I don't know if it's a requirement or not. We might want to get the, um, or I can try and get you the answer by talking to uh, Vepsi about it and uh, see how they how they structured. Okay. I just I just don't remember. Okay, we'll have Vepsi in. Okay. Senator McDonald, are you waving your hand or sh you shut yourself off for a minute? Okay. So, Madam Chair. Um... This is a slippery slope. We started off with TIFs where towns were able to pay for projects themselves, which benefited their grand lists. And as I've said before, I thought it got a little out of control. And now we are debating this committee, whether the proposed TIFs that are being proposed are of value to the towns. Um, this used to be a program where towns made the decision themselves, borrowed the money and paid for it over time. And now it, 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 it's been characterized as tips that this ed fund is the state bank and it appears um, we've got 15 pilot projects that go to the state bank, a pilot project. This is the whole graduating class of pilots. Um, but tips were never decisions that the, that, other, that the state made over whether it was a wise thing for the town to do. That was the town's decision. And now, we're, now that we're bankrolling it, we've, we're taking on a different role. End of my speech. Okay. Well, did, right. I, just, I just want to make sure that Senator McDonald saw the provision in the bill that you can only apply for these TIFs if you don't have a traffic light in your town. <laughs> that might help. Um, I think, I think. Thank goodness. No. <laughs> but lots of collisions. Um, I think the idea with TIFs originally was that you wouldn't be able to get your bond vote by the entire town. The town was poor, the town, you know, the folks in the hill weren't paying to fix up downtown. Uh, and that, that's been, you know, one of the ongoing considerations. It, it's for a certain section of town renewal you get into just improving your grand list, I guess my question is gonna be, and I will wait for, is the league supporting this? I, whichever group is supporting it is, why can't Westford just go out and bond to put in the filtration plant? Um, well, we can, we can get Westford in, and yes, the league is supportive of this. And I think you should hear from them. Um, the, um, my recollection is that if they put in their sewer plan as envisioned for the development around town, there wouldn't be enough uh, in user fees uh, of people who could hook up to this to sustain uh, the treatment plan. But we, you know, it's been a little while. I think that's right, but uh, so we'll, uh, we'll have to we'll have to check on that. Why is this necessary, Becky? Did you have your hand up? I got it. Um, I got no. So I I actually unfortunately have to uh, testify in another committee in a ah, few minutes. So let's uh, finish with you. Uh, so I think it might be helpful just to go through what is different from TIFs? Yes. Districts, if that works for the committee. 
Um, yes, I think that would be good. Language is just how um, tax increment can be set aside and used. And that's similar um, to what this committee has discussed many times about uh, with the TIP district. So um, I can uh, point you to uh, some differences, uh, uh, one being on page 13, subsection H, under the approval process for these uh, TIP no. Um, so BEPC uh, approves the projects based on criteria. Um, with the two districts, there are five criteria. Uh, there are project and location criteria that need to be met. Um, with these projects, um, there's the first criteria that, uh, sorry, that the, pro the proposed um, infrastructure improvements and project development or redevelopment are uh, compatible with confirmed municipal and regional development plans and the project has clear local and regional significance for employment, housing, or transportation improvements. And the second is that development clearly requires substantial public investment over and above the normal municipal operating or bonded debt expenditures. And then there has to be one of the four following criteria. Uh, those are, uh, the first is either development includes a new or rehabilitated affordable housing. Uh, the second is that the project will affect the re remediation and redevelopment of a brownfield located, located within the district. The third is that the development will include at least one entirely new business or business operation or expansion of an existing business within the project. And that business will um, provide new quality full-time jobs that meet or exceed the prevailing wage in that region as determined as reported by the Department of Labor. And then finally, the development will enhance transportation by creating improved traffic patterns and flow or creating or improving public transportation systems. So it's just one of those four rather than um, the, the five that are um, required for TIP districts. Um, and then I think, Madam Chair. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, I thought we had um, agencies that whose task was to build highways and um, remediate brownfields and um, stimulate investment through VITA, um, improve tra traffic patterns or other. And, and that's a general okay. fund responsibility. This yes, is, Senator, is Senator, be, I'm going to let you Becky... it to the Ed Fund to fund these things. Right. I'm going to let Becky finish. Oh, we I'm sorry. Have, I thought, we're going I thought to hear from points. ACCD. Okay. Yep. We're going to hear from the league and write down your questions. The, Becky's just walking us through what's in there. Oh, we've oh. met. Oh, no, that's the cat. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, and then I think the last point I would make, um, there, there are similar reporting and uh, requirements for these projects, uh, but on page um, 19, uh, so under the, the TIF districts, there's, uh, there's a TIF district rule um, where VEPSI uh, can implement the, that program. Since this is a pilot project, it, um, rather than uh, adopting a rule, BEPSI is authorized to adopt policies that are consistent with that rule um, to implement this section. Okay. Any requirements for the same auditing standards that we have in TIFs? Yes, they're oh. on page 17, subsection yeah, Yes is fine. Okay. <laughs> All right. They're they're a little different than than TIF districts, but they're they're also yeah, there, there is an audit. There are auditing requirements. Requirement. Okay. Okay. Um. So that is that. That's it for your sections of these bills. Yeah, that's it for me. Okay. So we'll get you to your other committee, hopefully on time. Okay. And we're going to. I've lost my agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, before you yes. uh, move on uh, to, to this, just to 
uh, address some of the questions that have been asked about why this particular project in Westford and yeah. how these particular projects differs from others that we're considering. The, 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 the plan for these small districts, as I understand them, and the other members of the committee, uh, uh, Senator Ballot and Senator Sorokin can chime in if I'm wrong or if my memory doesn't serve correctly, but it seems to me that, that one of the big issues is that these small rural communities don't have the equity to be able to pledge to a project in order to borrow the amount of money necessary in order to do it, and even though these are not huge sums uh, like we've seen in other TIF districts. But one of the advantages of being able to do it in this way is by, by the, the community could get grants uh, which require uh, a certain amount of money to be put, put up front, for example, in federal grant programs, and they don't have the equity to put that up. By putting it up in this fashion, they could be able to leverage funds in order to get uh, uh, the, the match that they need in order to get a, a, a project started uh, using other st uh, state and, and federal dollars. Uh, the, this is designed as uh, an economic development uh, tool. And in particular, the example of the, the rich that uh, Westford brought in is they have a, a downtown with a number of buildings, including some buildings that are functionally not usable because they don't have the wastewater and other capacity. Uh, they have, an, as, as I understand it, a particular developer who is willing to put in a uh, cafe restaurant uh, complex in the center of Westford, which again would provide what essentially is the only significant business there and also add one or two apartments in an existing building, but they need that wastewater in order to, to make the product. They can, without that, the project won't go, period. And so it will never be developed. And it's, it's those kinds of discrete things that are project oriented as opposed to the traditional tips, which are district oriented. And that's perhaps what separates them. And the notion is that, that by doing that, they will create a tax base that otherwise would not be created in order to provide funds to pay it back. Well put, Senator, well put. Okay. All right, David Hall, are you there, David? I am here. Okay, and I've got you on both bills, but I think it would be a lot less confusing if we, well, I don't know. Yeah, let's stick to 237. And then I've got Ellen, I've got Chris Corcoran, and then we can go down, well. If, if, if S-256 is just mine, and so if I did that one and then I did my part of 237, okay. Ellen and Chris could finish you off. Okay, I think I I think switching around between bills since the committee hasn't dealt with it for a while and we've never dealt with it, it's just getting a little confusing. So sure. if we can stick to one bill at a time, if we can do 256, mm -hmm and get through that, then we'll probably be in good shape. Okay, yeah, well, I, I'm happy to do that. So uh, would you like me, so David Hall, Legislative Council, would you like me to share my screen and go through it uh, together? Um, yeah, I think that might be helpful. Okay. Committee, if you have a question, you can do the blue hand thing or holler at me. Okay. All right. Um, 256. Just make sure that's what you're seeing. Are you seeing 256 now? Yes. Great. All right. So draft 7.1 is what came out of economic development. And yep. um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, this is uh, the Nominal Economic Development Bill, the first piece on uh, new worker recruitment. Um, I'll, I'll just say quickly, this would codify and consolidate into one permanent program what you have already adopted for the new worker relocation and the new remote worker programs. So it would keep the same substantive provisions, the same grants, the same eligibility criteria, um, consolidate the money. A person who qualified for one or the other would still qualify under this. It would just all be under the uh, umbrella of one single program. 
again, uh, permanently codified in Title 10 under the Agency of Commerce. Okay. Given the circumstances, the, the Economic Development Committee discussed this morning whether new worker recruitment is a timely subject. So <laughs> unless you have further questions on that, I can keep going. Um, I don't. I'm not seeing any blue hands. Anybody want to holler? Okay. We can keep going. All right. Uh, don't get dizzy as I scroll through. <clears throat> now where, what page are you going to? Uh, I am going to skip a lot. The reason being, all of this is these first seven pages are uh, six pages are all related to that. And then the next set of pages are all related to the project based TIF project, which right. uh, Becky just covered. So that is going to uh, allow us to, to fly across some more space. I apologize for the whizzing text. Yeah, all right. Uh, we've covered all of this. Do I think we're going to 18 for some reason? I believe so. Uh, even beyond. No, 19. Okay, here we are. So uh, I am now on page 19 of 27. Capital investment, at, okay. I'm looking at section six. Yeah. So uh, this proposal is part of the veggie program. Um, it actually would create a pilot program within veggie that uh, is targeted really towards smaller businesses with the goal of getting them money in hand upfront rather than paid out over a period of years. And um, it's a proposal that way back when the Agency of Commerce, Bepsi, and Vita all uh, collaborated on and brought to the legislature for consideration. Um, so essentially, in a nutshell, what would happen is an applicant in for a veggie incentive would come to Vepsi, would do the normal application process, uh, would provide some targets, performance requirements, and then if Vepsi approved that application, it would refer it to Vita. And Vita would do its own analysis and application and approval process pursuant to its own underwriting standards. And if both Vepsi and Vita approve the project for funding, then the amount of the projected incentive would be given to the company immediately upfront as a convertible loan. So you probably are familiar with Veggie at this point. You have to submit performance requirements. If you meet them, you file your report in April. And if the tax department verifies that you met the performance requirements, it gives you essentially one fifth of your incentive. And it pays the rest out over a period of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the purpose here would be to give you that money up front. It would be in the form of a loan, but it would be interest only payments. And the interest rate wouldn't be more than 1%. And if after the three year term of that loan, you were still in good standing, so you still had maintained your performance requirements, you checked all the boxes and everything else then that loan would convert to a grant and Vita would be made whole by a payment from the Department of Taxes from the withholding account and for the business. And then, then the grant would be uh, essentially the incentive payment written off by the agency. So it's not really a change in how much money you would qualify for. It's the same amount. The incentive would be the same value. It's really a timing question of when you get the money um, and, and the period of time over which the, the loan runs and then the payoff occurs. So I can go into more details than that if you'd like, or we can keep it at that high level for now. It's up to you. 
okay, right now, I get a VITA grant and it is paid out to me uh, every, every year for five years, so a fifth of it. And I have to meet basically the employment or the capital improvement standard. And if I don't, I have to pay the money back. Now this, so I get, under the standard loan, I get a fifth of it every year. All right? Are you referring to the current incentive program? The current VITA loan or VITA grants. Thank it you. gets paid out. And if I don't meet the criteria I got the grant under, then I have to pay it back. And they claw it back. If this would give me all the money up front. So I get five years worth in one lump sum. And if I don't meet the criteria, then I have to pay it back as a loan plus no more than 1% interest. Is that what it's doing? Uh, sort of. So right now, uh, you would go to VEPSI and you would submit your application for a veggie incentive. Right. And as you said, you would specify payroll performance requirements um, and uh, a, a, a jobs requirement. And yep. you can also submit a capital investment requirement, though you don't have to. Um, again, you would submit those targets for each year for which you were seeking an incentive. And so uh, right. for year one, you'd say I'm adding 10 jobs and a million dollars in payroll. April comes around, you submit your stuff to tax. If tax sees that you added those jobs and added that payroll, then they give you basically one fifth of the award for that year. And as long as you maintain those numbers, they give you another installment each year for four more years. So that's an incentive. If you don't make that incentive, if you don't meet those requirements, you do not get the money at all. You do have a little more time to try to make it in the following two years, but you do not get paid an incentive if you don't meet your targets. In this program, and again, it's, it's geared towards small business and you do have to uh, submit a capital performance requirement. Um, they give you, if you're approved by Vepsi and Vita, they do give you that money up front. Um, if you don't meet the requirements, remember that you have a loan right now from Vita mm -hmm. and that's all that you have. And so under the loan agreement, you are required to pay Vita back. Those first three years, which is the award period, it would be interest only payments. And again, the interest would not exceed 1%. But if by the time, by the end of that three year period, you had not met all your performance requirements, it does not convert and you just keep paying the loan. And at that point you would start paying principal and interest. Um, but you are legally obligated to repay the loan to Vita unless it converts to a grant and it's forgiven. So, it, yes, as you suggested, Madam Chair, you are getting money up front before you meet the performance requirements, which is obviously a fundamental difference um, with the underlying veggie program. But I, I think don't lose sight of the safeguard that the loan has to be separately approved by VITA before you get any of the money. And it's gonna be a loan on your books and theirs uh, unless and until you meet your requirements and it converts. Okay. Any questions from the committee at this point? Uh, I just think if I'm if I'm remembering correctly and reading page twenty two correctly, is when it says the limitation, 
is one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. Is that a limitation on the size of the loan that could be turned into a grant? Yes, yes. Uh, there are there there are many details in here. I'm happy to dig into. Sure, that's one of them. Um, you'll see hopefully on your screen subsection C here limitations. So the, as Senator Sorokin indicates, the amount of the incentive would be capped at $150,000. And here under C2, um, as you're probably aware, there is an annual statutory cap on the total amount of incentives that BEPC can approve through the veggie program. That's initial $15 million and a final $10 million. So of those statutory limits, this program uh, is capped at 1.5 million. So that's not an additional 1.5 million to the statutory cap, that is part of the statutory cap. So those two limitations, in addition to limiting the eligibility to businesses of 30 or fewer employees, um, do narrow the scope of the program. And in essence, it's considered to be a pilot program given the small number of incentives uh, that would be eligible. So I'm not sure if I might jump yeah. in and just say in our committee discussion this morning, as I previewed for you, there are things in this bill, such as this particular program that were put together before we knew of COVID-19. Right. Our charge may have changed quite a bit in terms of a potential piece of legislation that deals with recovery that we would like to work with the administration on. And this, this may fall by the wayside, this particular one. It was proposed at very different times and we may have very different and broader or bigger um, and more immediate needs to, to address. So I just wanna put that in perspective. Oh, I was just thinking this might be the one with the best chance of survival for exactly those reasons. Well, it may be, but we yeah. just have to look at, you know, how it fits in with uh, other other proposals we might want to do. It, it, remind, it looks a lot like the PPP program in some ways, that, but it may fill in some of the cracks that PPP didn't cover. Well, it might be a vehicle. I know the governor has a, an economic recovery task force yes. and it might turn into a vehicle um, or part of you know, an, an economic recovery program. Right. Uh, something to think about, probably more so than mini TIFs. Um, now we like mini TIFs. I, I'm, I'm sure you do. I just need to be sold and I'm the one that loves TIFs, so. Well, you'll love mini TIFs then. I'll love mini TIFs. I'm also looking at $150 million deficit in the Ed Fund, so that tempers my amorous feelings towards TIFs. Okay, we'll figure it. <laughs> Um, okay, any questions for David on these committee members? Okay, not at this point. Any questions on this entire bill that we need to get addressed? Yeah. Right now I've got- I haven't finished it yet. Um, the I'm things on my, my list is an update on the projections for the property transfer tax. And then VEPSI, and I think that's for the next bill. And then VEPSI and VITA and probably the Agency of Community Development on both of these bills, or at least on the on this bill. Uh, David, David hasn't finished this bill yet. There are okay, yeah. Madam Chair. Senator McDonald. This, I'm gonna say this bill, it has two halves. It has the mini TIFs and it has the new VITA um, grant, possible grant program. Is that correct? No, there's several. There's, there's more. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, okay keep going. Sure, so I, I, I've just skipped over um, some other uh, VEPC. There's two other VEPC pieces, both uh, are reports that would go along with. Okay. Um, the convertible loan program, but one is about the implementation. The other is a is a study and a report uh, concerning its internal audit procedures, its review of the but for process, and other things. So that's section eight. Um, 
Okay. Section nine uh, is an increase to the downtown and village center tax credit. And obviously this goes up from 2.6 million to 4 million. So don't miss that. Uh, no. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Um, and then there are appropriations. Um, are you interested in hearing about these? We might as well know what they are. They're sure. not in our jurisdiction, but we should know what's in here. Okay, very good. So um, in section 10 here, there are a lot of appropriations currently in this bill for FY21. Uh, the first is $1 million to the Secretary of State to complete the work it is doing to design and implement the one-stop business portal for businesses. That's been a several years process, and this is a mm -hmm. funding to complete that. Um, subdivision two, six hundred thousand dollars to agency of commerce. This all relates to the small business innovation innovation research program. That's a federal grant for small businesses. Um, so there's two pieces to it. A two hundred thousand of it would be uh, for technical service providers to assist uh, business applicants for the federal grant. And then the $400,000 would be to provide a 50-50 state match to those businesses that are successful in receiving a federal grant. The state portion of that would be uh, not more than $50,000. Subdivision so three is $250,000 to the Department of Tourism for marketing, uh, both tourism, economic development, and outdoor recreation marketing. And then uh, subdivision four is $500,000 to VEDA for interest rate subsidies, loan loss reserves, and the cost of administering the capital investment convertible loan program, which we just discussed. Okay. Any question? Any questions there? Okay. That's 256. That's not us. Okay. That's 256. Any questions, committee, on 256? I am not hearing any. So we can go on to the next bill. Uh, the next bill is 237. Um, that's the housing bill. And uh, if you take the second part first, uh, which is my part, then you can get to Ellen and Chris on all the land use and okay. resource planning and things. Um, I have several discrete pieces that cover different subjects than their pieces. Are you ready for those? Yeah, I'm on 237. What you're starting with? Section 17. Ah, 17. Okay, this is not working. What page? Page 33. All right, I got a long way to go. Okay. Hmm. So Next, we're going to have a requirement that we only have one drafter on any bill that's brought to us. If we had a single subject like rule in our Constitution, that would work. <laughs> okay, we're this off. Face, um, interrupting. David, would you like to pull it up and share your uh, screen? I believe that I am. Okay. Can people yep, see he does. Section 17? Yes, but are you on the right page, David? Uh, yeah. Think, oh, yes. I'm, yes. Okay, there it is. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Does everybody see a uh, statewide housing study? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You, you could hit a couple of little pluses there, David, and make it a bit bigger for us. You'd like to see bigger? Oh, I was just going to say the opposite, but that's fine. I... How about here? Yes, yes. Superman down there with <laughs> x-ray vision. I've got it on my computer so I can read it. <laughs> okay, off we All go. Right. So section 17, uh, as the subject title indicates, is the housing study. It would be done by DHCD working with Dale. Um, but it's a housing study to evaluate current and projected needs for age-specific housing in Vermont and would include recommendations for age-specific housing plan and policies, measurable objectives that are focused on older Vermonters 
in particular of those of very low income or our uh, caregivers of people living with disabilities. I'm sorry, I think there's a parade. Sorry, I don't know what's going on out there. Uh, are we protesting something or celebrating? Uh, I'm on North Street, Madam Chair. I don't know if it's coming. I don't know. Place. That's not a place where you usually get it. <laughs> any parades <laughs> too um, steep to march up right so um section 18 becky already addressed this is the vhcb funding section so i'm going to skip that one um the next two pieces uh sections 19 and 20 deal with short-term rentals so uh, in section 19, this is giving DHCD the authority to adopt emergency rules to collect data that will allow the state to understand the impact of short-term rentals on the availability of housing, balancing the privacy interests of short-term rental operators and guests. Um, it would call for a report next January to committees of jurisdiction. Uh, including information about the data it collects and any housing needs assessment that the department is doing right now with VHFA and VHCB, compilation of legal frameworks adopted by U.S. states regulating short-term rentals, and then recommendations for any statutory municipal regulation of short-term rentals. So this, again, th in large part, this process is underway at DHCD, but um, this is uh, this authority to give them uh, the ability to do emergency rules and collect data is to just be sure that they have all the underlying information they need uh, to evaluate short-term rentals in its place in our housing profile. Okay. Could I ask you a question about that? Yes. David is, uh, I'll look at the language more closely, but I understand, I think, what we're after with this language, but it's not only one-sided coin, right? The short-term housing rentals bring economic, uh, economic activity, you know, boost the tourism sector, et cetera. Is that meant to be studied here or somewhere else? Or are we just looking at simply the sort of occupation, uh, uh, the, the housing being occupied piece of the coin. I I th I think that the purpose here is to uh, to look at short term rentals in the broader context of uh, the housing portfolio of the entire state, and and I don't know that it speaks um, really to the economic development side of what short term rentals bring to the state so much. Uh, but I think it's more geared toward understanding, um, you know, the, the breadth of the usage of properties for this purpose and frankly, whether or not and how the state should take a broader role uh, than what it currently does in regulating them. I think that's the real thrust. As you probably are well aware that right now there's a just minimal amount of involvement on, at the state level of short-term rentals. Um, so this, this really is about uh, the scope of the practice and then whether, whether the state should regulate them more. Madam Chair? Yes, Senator McDonald. Um, in one sentence, what is a short-term rental? Uh, it's a short-term occupancy that you would, for instance, on Airbnb or VRBO. Fewer than 30 days, non-permanent occupation. So uh, renting a, a house or a room or an apartment out on a short-term basis, usually- I think it's the fewer than 30 days, isn't it? Fewer than that. 30 days, yep. Thank you. There, there's actually a definition in the next section. Our statutory uh, definition begins on line 10 it's a furnished house, condo, or other dwelling room or self-contained dwelling unit rented to the transient traveling or vacationing public for a period of fewer than 30 consecutive days 
and for more than 14 days per calendar year. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So that's a good segue into this next section. So section 20, we are in title 24 now in section 2291. This is the place in the statute uh, that governs ordinances and what uh, authority towns across the board have to regulate certain activities. Um, being, being a Dillon's rule jurisdiction, the municipalities only have the authority specifically dedicated uh, to them by the state. So that happens in one of two ways. You either have charters, which are specific to particular municipalities, or you have uh, other general authority that applies across the board, usually through ordinances or bylaws. This would authorize all municipalities to regulate by means of an ordinance or by law, the operation of short-term rentals within the municipality, provided that the ordinance or bylaw does not adversely impact the availability of long-term rental housing. So this allows the regulation of short-term rentals at the local level. No guidance there, just says the town can do what it wants. Uh, as long as it does not adversely impact the availability of long-term rental housing. I'm assuming that's not defined. It is not. Okay. I guess initially I have some concern about something that wide open and the potential for discrimination. Um, certain sections of town might be banned and not others. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. You do it for all short-term housing, I suppose, you know, a universal ordinance, but if you just, as you do with zoning, say not in this certain section of town, is it allowed? Um, that has some, that has some concerns. Okay. But that that we can we can talk about. Okay. All right. Um, the next piece uh, switches gears to homelessness prevention. Um, so, in the first instance, in a this is directing uh, human services to take reasonable measures. Uh, including increasing case management services under the Housing First model to reduce the loss of specialized federal rental assistance vouchers. Um, you may remember reports of this much earlier in the year in a different lifetime um, where there, uh, it looked like Vermont was leaving money on the table uh, mm -hmm because of the way its services are arranged and offered through the, some of the systems we have now. So uh, the purpose here really matches with an appropriation later in the bill to try to align our services with federal standards to get as much of that money as we can. Um, and then in subsection B here, uh, really the duty to report back to you committees of jurisdiction uh, on what progress they made on this front. Okay. In section 22, we pivot to mobile homes. So uh, this piece deals directly with the Department of Environmental Conservation. And it charges the department to basically work with the town of Brattleboro and the Tri Park Cooperative, which is a large mobile home park in that area, which faces um, a number of issues concerning homes in the floodplain and the need for infrastructure upgrades to allow a large portion of those homes to continue uh, to be occupied. So uh, DEC is charged with working with them 
to implement the tripart master plan and the tactical basin plan, both of which have provisions and a timeline on how to ameliorate these issues, uh, including through loan forgiveness or restructuring of state revolving loans. And it's two specific loans that are through a particular revolving loan fund and additional loans to allow for the relocation of homes in the floodplain and improvements to wastewater and stormwater infrastructure needs. That's one. Two, to provide similar assistance to the extent possible to similarly situated mobile home parks that also have relocation or infrastructure needs. And three, to identify statutory and programmatic changes necessary to assist in the implementation of the plans and improve access in terms by the parks, other communities, in the Clean Water Revolving Loan Fund, the Water Infrastructure Sponsorship Program, and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. So that's a lot of gobbledygook, but basically, uh, Department of Conserv uh, excuse me, the Department of Environmental Conservation administers these revolving funds. They're yep. largely federally funded. Um, I don't recall the amount in them at this point, but it's sizable in the millions. And um, so, you know, essentially trying to encourage the department to be flexible uh, in the administration of those funds and whether that's through loan forgiveness, restructuring, low interest loans, or even if possible, uh, changing over to grants may not be possible, but it's directing them to explore those steps and try to get more of this money to mobile home parks that have these infrastructure needs. Okay. Those are the revolving loan funds I was thinking of during the mini TIF discussion. Sure. I thought we did, I knew we had ways to fund clean water and uh, wastewater projects. And those funds okay. do have money at this point. Um, the next piece, similar vein, uh, this is what was codified in 10 VSA 10 as the, um, this is basically the 10% for Vermont uh, program in the treasurer's office, allowing the treasurer to create this credit facility for local investments um, I'm sure you've heard the treasurer's report on this over the years, um, but this specifically goes to mobile homes. It adds to the statutory authority here. Uh, the ability to use amounts available in this credit facility to provide financing for infrastructure projects in Vermont mobile home parks and modify the terms of financing in the treasurer's discretion as necessary to promote the availability of mobile home park housing and protect the interests of the state. Um, I, I, I think there's a pretty solid argument to be made that the treasurer could already use the credit facility mm -hmm. for this purpose, but obviously um, adding mobile home park housing and infrastructure needs specifically to the statute uh, places an emphasis on that purpose. David. I guess one of my, my concern that came out during Irene mm -hmm. and we were rehousing, we lost a lot of mobile homes parks because they tend to be in less desirable, i.e. floodplain areas. Um, but this is housing that essentially doesn't appreciate, it depreciates, it's, it's housing, but it's not the investment that stick built housing is that generally appreciates and we were in response to an emergency then but I at that point I think it was Sandra Luzzi who was down the other end of the hall was trying to talk about do we have any way of starting to get people into affordable stick built homes um, they probably wouldn't have the sunken tubs and skylights that some of the double wides now have, but they would they would they would be an investment for people, which, especially a single wide, is not. Um, 
and as, as the house, uh, maybe it's for Senator Sorotkin. Has anyone given any thought to how we start moving people out of mobile home parks? Well, the rest of the bill, which we'll get into, deals with your concern about creating more affordable stick built housing. But we heard some very compelling testimony, especially from Tri Park, about people who are being immediately dislocated. Yes. Planes, and this is their only asset that they have, and they're trying to find ways to accommodate it. We viewed, uh, I think, mobile homes as quite differently, as potentially as a very affordable form of housing for for certain uh, for certain locations and certain populations, and and it we felt that that choice should still be made available to them. So a, a direct answer to your question, I don't think there's anything in this bill to try and get people out of mobile homes into stick built housing. Right. No, I think it was just, is there thought, you know, be, as we're, we're investing, and I understand right now we're investing because this is people's homes, but this is about the only form of housing that depreciates. Um, if it, even if it's maintained, it depreciates. Um, it's harder to get loans for it. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, as we go through our thought process and move into the future, if we're thinking about affordable, and that would probably mean, you know, something you could afford once it was built. Um, well, we, you know, we did a we did a housing tour this fall, went all around the state, and um, uh, yes, we've heard about ideas for much smaller units, uh, trying to cut back on regulation and open up various spaces to make homes more smaller, more affordable. I think we also heard pretty loud and clear that at least presently, uh, mobile homes. Uh, one of the mo more affordable options that oh they are monitors have so until we I don't, I, yeah it'd be great if we could do that i think you'll see in uh, the rest of the bill that we're trying to move in that direction uh, but for the time being we don't want to see people displaced from their mobile homes yeah no, I'm one of the things chair that we're also excuse me Go ahead. that we're also considering is the fact that we have an immediate housing crisis and when we start talking about stick built homes, particularly in the way that we do it with the affordable housing apparatus, uh, we're talking about years to get anything done. Mobile homes can be purchased and put on site in 30 to 60 days at a price people can afford. Yeah, that's why there are so many of them. Okay. And so if I could, Madam Chair, this is Becca. Yeah. Um, just to, I, I know that um, the whole, Economic Development and Housing um, Committee felt pretty moved by a number of folks who came forward during our, our road trip to talk about really what their mobile home parks meant to them, that it wasn't just the housing itself, but it was the environment in which they were living. And they felt like they had some of the most beautiful spots, you know, in the in the woods and um, really tucked away. That's definitely true about the mobile home parks here in Brattleboro. Of course, the challenge going forward is that a lot of the land is in the floodway and not just here at Brattleboro. Right. So, but I just wanted to make sure I brought that into the conversation. There were a significant number of people who, who really don't want to move. They like where they are. They like their situation. The yeah, exactly. So thank you. Okay. Okay. David, are we still on you? We are, I, I'm about, I'm almost done. Um, the next okay. piece you may have already seen because it has been percolating now for a couple of years. It's the housing, Vermont Housing Incentive Program. Um, this is a program through DHCD to provide grants to landlords to make improvements to their rental properties. Um, you know, obviously subject to conditions. It, it's basically money that would flow uh, 
through the Department of Housing and Community Development, through regional nonprofit partners to landlords. Um, and it's based on, uh, I believe, the NeighborWorks model down in Rutland, I want to say. Um, but um, somewhere. You'll see there are grant requirements, and these are a little bit different than from a version that was passed uh, previously. Um, and still the case that a, a property has to be um, in need of rehabilitation in order to come into compliance with code. So it could qualify as vacant or blighted or you'll see in line 11 otherwise not it does not comply with applicable rental housing health and safety laws that is an expansion from the version that has passed the body before the reason being um that if th this this proposal was being worked through in conjunction with uh, the change in the rental housing health and safety inspection system. And the thought here is that if it's vacant or blighted, that means it's not uh, habitable. And bringing that back online is the goal. But if you want to be able to make substandard housing better and in compliance with code, um, that is not an eligible use of the money if your standard is only vacant or blighted. And so this third category was added that it may otherwise not comply with applicable housing health and safety laws. Um, under two here, the owner, the landlord still has to match the value of the grant at least two to one. And it has to be through his or her own funds, not through services. It still has to have a weatherization component and it still has to be, the work has to comply with permit and other applicable laws and requirements. Okay. Under three, the department and the owner have to ensure that not fewer than half of the rental units improved with grant funds have rents that are affordable to households earning not more than 80% of area median income. And they have to remain affordable at that level for not less than seven years. You'll see in four, if they don't, or if you sell or transfer the property within that seven years, you either have to give the money back or you have to covenant with the buyer to ensure that it remains affordable at the level for whatever the remaining period is of that seven years. Okay. The last piece, the definitions of blighted vacant, those are the same uh, as previously, not fit for habitation or hasn't been occupied for 90 days. Um, David, uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Just an interpretation. I know, I think I asked this before and I think I, I, I think I remember the answer, but I just wanna make sure. If you take a look at page 41, uh, beginning line 19, subsection three, uh, shall ensure that not fewer than half of the rental units improved with grant funds. Uh, if a, uh, and I know that we have a four unit or smaller uh, piece here, but if a, uh, an owner improves a single property, does that in fact mean that 100% of the properties he's improving have to meet those uh, uh, affordability criteria? I, I believe that that unit will have to meet the criteria. Yeah, as opposed to overall, vis-a-vis 40% uh, or rather overall uh, 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 applied to a certain percentage of the gross program as opposed mm -hmm. to each individual owner? Well, it's the number of units improved with the grant funds. So, um, But is it for a, each individual property owner who, mm -hmm. as an example, has just one property or sure. is it for the overall program that half the rental units of the overall program meet that, but an individual property owner might not. That's that's the, the essence of the question. Yeah, I believe it's per property owner, not for the entirety wow. of the program. I would, okay. Because those, the duty 
to maintain that affordability flows to and through the property owner for as long as well if you know for the time that they own it and then also that duty would flow to the next owner if that seven year period has not met so to me that says this is an individual property owner requirement not a program wide requirement thank you okay because when you first read it, I would have interpreted it the other way. Um, so we, I think that should be very clear before we go forward. Yeah, and, and you would be the exception, I suppose. Yeah, if you had one or two units, you'd have to have at least 50% of your units because you can't get, you can't rent a section of a unit. I don't think. Okay. So in line 20, it could say half of the property owners rental units, if you wanted to just be crystal clear there. I, I hear or you. it'd be of the improved units, right? Because they might yes. own buildings in several cities and just improve one. Sure. I mean, if it said half of the owner's rental units that were improved with grant funds. Yeah. yeah. I hear you. All right. Might have um, some high-end uh, units somewhere else. Sure. Um, the last piece, the appropriations, um, I'll, I'll cover those quickly. So 150000 goes to the uh, Municipal and Regional Planning Fund to the RPCs to assist municipalities updating their bylaws to include inclusionary housing bylaws, sort of goes to Ellen's pieces. Another 150 uh, goes to the municipal planning commissions to assist municipalities updating their bylaws. 50,000 goes to ACCD to provide technical assistance to homeowners and developers who seek to develop ADUs, accessory dwelling units for existing properties and for small residential projects of less than a million dollars in construction costs. Subsection D, this $800,000 goes along with the homelessness prevention for wraparound services through AHS. And then the last piece E is $1 million for that VHIP program. That's it for me. Okay. Questions for David at this point. Okay. Right. Thank you. We'll go on to Ellen. And Ellen is here, okay. What section is yours, Ellen? What page better? Start right at page one. Ah, oh, I'm on yes. 38. This'll take a minute. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that, it goes faster that way, all right. Um, do you want me to share my screen too and go through uh, it that way? Katie, is that helpful? Yes, it is. Okay, that's helpful. Very helpful. I think it's the one. No, it's this one. Okay, so. Okay, sorry, I'm figuring it out. All right. Here you go. Okay. So Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. So there are a lot of sections in S-237 related to municipal zoning, land use, and Act 250. Mm -hmm. So starting on page one with section one, um, we actually, right before the building closed, I walked through these sections with you. Um, and so I don't know if you remember, so I'll- I don't. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and I have 33 pages of this bill, so it is a lot of information. Okay. So um, I'll go fairly high level and we can talk about the details um, if you prefer. Okay. And if um, this starts jogging people's memory and they're getting bored, let me know and we'll tell Ellen to jump ahead. All right. All right, so section one, we're amending the section related to municipal plans, and we're requiring that they add um, onto their utility and facility maps 
um, water supply and sewer lines, facility and service areas. Um, these are details and information that are helpful and the um, would be mm -hmm. information that would be beneficial to have on the maps. So that's added on page one. Okay. Next on what page. If, what if they don't know? I, I mean, I literally uh, had to site a filtration plant or was trying to in a town where there were several if um actually there was a section of town sewer but a whole lot of private septic systems that may have disappeared by now but not all towns have municipal systems and a lot of towns have private water systems i don't know if they know all of those either do we know that? I'll ask the league. <laughs> I I don't know. Um, and Chris Cochran may have more information on that. that. Okay, I'm hoping I, he's listening and he may know that. I don't know. It, I know. I know. Recently, there are towns um, that have all private water systems, meaning systems that serve sections of town, not just private wells. So um, we'll see what, what he has to say. And if not, we'll ask the league. Okay. Okay. All right, page two, uh, we're requiring still that the housing element um, of the town plan comply with the requirements of section 4412 to provide affordable housing. So we'll discuss that more momentarily. Um, mm -hmm. It's a expansion um, previously just re was requiring um, accessory dwelling units. So just slight expansion based on these changes. So I, next, I, we oh. did, there, I thought there was, I remember being on a committee for a town plan or maybe it was just a municipal plan. You did have to have a, affordable and affordable housing section do they not have to do that now uh, and this is putting it in because i know it was there once it was required but we're adding uh we're adding new sections to 4412 regarding affordable housing okay so i think this is just to sort of broaden the scope of what needs to be addressed in it okay okay uh section two so now we're in 24 vsa 4412 we're talking about municipal bylaws. So we're adding new language at the top of page three um, that requires that if there is a, a regulatory district that allows multi-unit dwellings as opposed to single family dwellings, you um, must allow up to four units. Uh, so you can prohibit more than that, but up to four units must be allowed if it is a multi-unit district. Okay. So you can't just have townhouses with two districts. All right. Uh, next is the section regarding uh, ADUs, accessory dwelling units. So we're changing the definition of an accessory dwelling unit here. So uh, first, we're striking the requirement that the single that the single family dwelling unit be owner occupied, uh, which is the current law they have to, it has to be on an owner occupied lot so that gives some flexibility of where the owner can live uh, next it clarifies that uh, an accessory dwelling unit should be subject to the same level of review as the single family dwelling unit not more or less um, we then also strike the requirement that the unit be an efficiency or one bedroom apartment um, just that it be a distinct unit to, again, provide more flexibility of what these units can look like. And then we, we change the size cap slightly. So the unit will not exceed 30% of the total habitable floor area of the single family unit or 900 square feet, whichever is greater. So this was in response to concerns that small homes would not be able to add 
much in the way of an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, next, on to page four. Um, this is just saying nothing in this section shall be construed to prohibit uh, the re a bylaw that regulates short-term rental units distinctly from residential units. Uh, next, we're adding a slight change to the uh, regulation of existing small lots. So a municipality may prohibit development on a lot not served and able to connect to municipal water and sewer if it is less than one acre, one eighth of an acre. So if it can connect um, those small lots, uh, they can't prohibit development on them. Wait, now, I know there's lot sizes and frontage sizes. I know in my neighborhood, there was one lot that now doesn't qualify as a lot. It's been divided amongst the neighbors. But if that, it definitely can hook to municipal water and sewer. Could those neighbors now say, look, I own this lot. You prohibited me from developing it. And so I pretty much gave it away to the neighbors that abutted it. But now you say I could have developed it and I've lost value. As I, we're saying that if there are very small lots and I have three acre zoning or one acre zoning in my section of town, if there's an eighth of an acre that could connect to municipal water and sewer that the town has to let the eighth of an acre hook up? Yes, yes. And could so. you subdivide your one acre lot into eight, eight, eight mini lots? I think that's a totally different question that, that depended upon subdivision rules. Yeah. So this is just if there's a lot sitting there. Exactly. Yeah. It hasn't been subdivided, but if it just happens to be there, then I would have to let it be built on. If it could connect. To right, connect. if it could connect, yeah. Are we doing away with the state sewer hookup charge in this bill? Not that I'm aware of. Don't want to well, go. You have to pay a hookup fee to both the municipality and the state. Jeff Winberg and I both tried to get rid of that. We, we actually do something in terms of yes. eliminating duplicate regulation. I don't know about, yeah, I guess so that you would get rid of the fee. You Good. Might, they have gotten rid of it. Yep. Okay. Yes, those are the last sections um, of my section. You may have There's... gotten my vote. All right. <laughs> Okay. All right. So then on page five. So page five is a is a new program we're calling inclusive development. So this is what we're sort of talking about as an opt an, a required but opt out program uh, related to municipal bylaws. So we're going to require that all of the following bylaws apply uh, apply in municipalities. Um, they don't go into effect for three years, however, so they're initially voluntary, um, but after three years, they will be required. However, at the end, there is an opt-out for municipalities that um, claim to have, that establish that they have a substantial constraint that won't allow it. So uh, first, no bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting lots of one quarter acre that can that are able to connect to water or one eighth of an acre that are able to connect to water and sewer. Uh, so you could have a quarter acre lot with a septic system? It's municipal, um, sorry, it's municipal, where is it? No, why do you say water and sewer on an eighth of an acre and only water on a quarter acre? Yeah, so 
Um, so that would imply I could have a septic system on a quarter acre lot. Right. Did we check that with septic regulations? I, no, I, I can look into it. I would check on it because I don't, I think you would be pretty tight in getting a leach field on a quarter acre. Uh, this, this is this is Chris Cochran here. If if you um, install water lines, you can do um, higher density wastewater disposal on site. Okay, can you do it in a quarter acre? Yes. <laughs> okay. Not in my backyard. It's still bubbling. Okay. Okay. Oh, because um, you've got to have the separation with the well in the septic. All right. I got it. Okay. <laughs> um, next, uh, B down on line 17, uh, shall condition any subdivision approval on obtaining a state wastewater permit under 10 VSA chapter 64. Next, uh, no bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting um, or requiring conditional use for duplex units that are able to connect to water and sewer operated by the municipality to a greater ex to the greater extent than a one unit dwelling would be okay. restricted. Um, can we move back to B? Sure. Appropriate municipal panel or mis as applicable shall con no, it says shall condition any, so they are required to get a state wastewater permit. Yes. Or are so, they prohibited from making their approval conditional on getting a state wastewater permit? So I'm a little confused with this language also. Um, I the uh, the wastewater permit language that we're going to talk about towards the end was added towards the end, and I am wondering if this conflicts with that, um, because this is requiring um, obtaining a state wastewater permit, but later it seems that we're turning that power over to the municipality. So I and have that, yeah, flagged the last that as a potential conflict. issue. I, I think now you have to get a state wastewater permit. Correct, when you're, when yeah. you're um, creating a subdivision. Right, and this would give it to the municipalities. All right, but this, yeah. That would definitely be a conflict if that's what you're going to do further down. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. So C is about um, requiring duplexes to have the same level of review as one unit um, dwellings. And then D relates to parking space minimums. So it if would, I'm, I'm going back to C. Yep. Yep. If you are putting up rental housing, you have to have sprinkler systems. And I don't know if that, if two if duplexes are excluded, I don't think so. But you don't, even in the city of Montpelier now, have to put them in single family units. Would this exclude duplexes from having to put in those kinds of fire codes? if they're going to be rented or would rental still prevail? That's just a question I to, to look I, at. Maybe I'm Chris knows sure. when Chris gets up, maybe he knows. Yeah. Okay. Um, Montpelier has a specific ordinance on, that requires sprinklers that are higher than the rest of the states. Yeah, we did um, away with the single family. Yeah. The need but for sprinklers. You don't have, I think, if you, at least if you change a single family into rental unit, or if you are doing a rental unit or a condominium, there are much more inclusive fire codes. And I just when, wonder if by saying duplexes and single units are the same, if I'm doing three sets of duplex condominiums, am I excluding 
those fire codes that because I don't have, I can do whatever I want in my house. Um, I can't in a condo because there's joint ownership. I can't, I don't think in an apartment that's rented to the public. And just wanted to make sure, just make sure we know what we're doing here. But we'd be happy to confer with fire safety to make sure. Yeah, this check is on that. Support. Thank you. All right. Uh, right. So then D is about parking minimums. So if there is a, a parking minimum for residential properties and the parking spaces will be leased separately from the units, it shall count as two spaces for meeting for the purpose of meeting the parking minimum if located within a half mile of a transit stop. Okay. Are we going right. to do thing about parking impact fees? I assume we still have those. I think you asked me that the last time and I I don't know anything about parking impact fees. I they were the thing when we were trying to discourage development and you could do a recreation, a school, a parking and the idea was it went into a fund and eventually we would provide parking, but we had a local doctor who was up in the thousands of dollars because he bought the house he'd had his office in and then put two apartments upstairs and it was downtown and it was a ridiculously high fee. And I'm just wondering, um, I'm assuming some places like Burlington some downtowns may well have those still. Just so, worth, I'll, I'll, we'll ask the league to check that. So yeah, so we aren't amending a, a municipality's ability in regards to that. We're just um, changing the calculation here. Right. So they probably still have that ability elsewhere. But that might be more of a deterrent to down to downtown development of especially rental units. The okay. probably should check on it. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, those four sections do not go into effect until 2023. So they're voluntary, but after that point, they will be required. However, uh, down starting on line 15, a municipality may opt out of those requirements if they file a substantial municipal constraint report with the Department of Housing and Community Development. So if they um, can establish that they have constraints um, on municipal water, sewer, or other services that would prevent this, yes, they can file a report. Given and, by the state of Vermont. What? No, oh. we do. This Montpelier water filtration plant by state regulation had to be sized only for the growth that the state thought projected we would have in Montpelier in the next 10 years. We are thus unable to provide water to the town of Berlin, even though we take it out of their town. Um, there was a time when the state didn't want housing developed. Only a few of us have probably been around long enough to remember it, but um, I know for a fact that Montpelier's filtration plant was reduced in size by the state of Vermont so that we wouldn't be tempted to sell water to other municipalities. So that may be out there in other filtration plants or wastewater systems. Just sins of the fathers. Okay. Right, so a lot of those uh, uh, provisions above are encouraging uh, more dense so. development. And mm -hmm. so if there are constraints on the water and sewer, there, there may be reasonable reasons why they can't have that extensive okay. development. Okay. So uh, 
the department will release a uh, guidance and a template on the what should be in the constraint report by January 1, 2021. Uh, the department will post all of the reports on the website and provide copies to the Regional Planning Commission, state pro program directors for municipal water and sewer funding, Vermont Community Development Board, Downtown Development Board, BHCB, and the NRB as well as anyone requesting notice. Uh, any person may provide comment on a municipality's report and the department will post the comments on their website as well. Municipalities are required to update their report whenever they update their plan or bylaws and failure to do so will disqualify them from the incentives in the next section. So there are incentives with adopting these bylaws. Um, on or before July 1, 2021, any municipality that requests technical assistance in updating their bylaws from the Regional Planning Commission uh, shall receive priority technical assistance through additional funding that David mentioned earlier. So there's, uh, there are two appropriations related to this so that municipalities can update their bylaws. And then also uh, for municipalities that are actively pursuing um, updating their bylaws to comply with this section, they will receive priority funding from the uh, state funding for municipal water and sewer systems, the municipal planning grants, the Vermont Community Development Program, and the Neighborhood Development Area Tax Credit Program. And then the last incentive uh, relates to restrictive deeds and covenants. So in a municipality that has adopted the inclusive development bylaws, deeds may not be restricted by covenants, conditions, or restrictions that conflict with these bylaws. And if they, if de if they do, they will not be um, enforceable. So this section below, section three, lays out the language related to that. So deed restrictions, covenants, or similar binding agreements added after July 1, 2021, that prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting land development allowed under the municipal bylaws in a municipality that has adopted the inclusive development bylaws shall not be valid. This wow. section shall not affect the enforceability of other property interests um, held. So the rest of this language was suggested by um, some of the advocates, um, VHCB wanted to make sure that some of their um, restrictive covenants were exempt from this, but the intent is related to um, preventing people from overriding the inclusive development bylaws uh, through deed restrictions. So the deed restrictions on my deed that says I can only put up colonial architecture would be overridden? So that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking primarily about um, sort of the small lots. Um, so I can't subdivide. I can't have more than one acre lot in my subdivision. No mobile homes allowed. That's frequently in a deed for land. I'll sell it to you, but no mobile homes allowed. Is that what you're getting rid of? I don't think it's gonna to apply to, to mobile homes, but they, and there are going to be new deed restrictions. Um, we can't invalidate already existing deed restrictions, but moving forward, mm -hmm. uh, deed restrictions that seek to override um, the denser development provisions in the inclusive, um, those will not be valid. Okay, so I can't sell an acre of my land and say, but you can't subdivide it into eighth or an acre lots? Right. Right, so like if a, if a developer is developing a neighborhood can't include new deed restrictions saying 
only single family housing on one acre is, is allowed. Okay. But if he builds only single family housing on one acre, he's all right. Potentially. Okay. Okay. All right, so uh, section four is a report on uh, municipal constraints. So uh, the department will come back in 2023 and report uh, the number of municipalities that have reported constraints, what the constraints are, the impact on uh, developing housing in those areas and uh, recommendations for reducing or eliminating the constraints. All right. So that, so now we're gonna to shift to the language related to the Act 250 downtown exemption. So this, uh, this section is going to exempt designated downtowns and neighborhood development areas from Act 250. It does a couple of other things also. So first there is a mm -hmm. technical correction related to the definition of mixed income housing. Um, needed to adjust the definition to reflect changes um, in the calculation that have been made by um, the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. So um, owner occupied housing at the initial time of sale, at least 20% of the housing units meet the requirement of affordable owner occupied housing under subdivision 29A of this section, adjusted for the number of bedrooms as established and published annually by the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Uh, similar language for rental housing as well. Uh, then there's a, a change to the definition of priority housing project uh, because currently under the, the Act 250 def definition, it relates to uh, projects located within designated downtown or neighborhood development areas. So that language is, struck, uh, is stricken because we're exempting wholly those areas from Act 250 um, in the next section. Okay. So in section six, we're in uh, section 6081 of Act 250, which is the exemption section. So uh, okay. subdivision O says that if, uh, if the designation either of a uh, downtown development district or a neighborhood development area is removed. Um, subsequent development uh, will need to go through Act 250. And then in P is where we exempt um, neighborhood development, uh, downtown development districts and neighborhood development areas from Act 250. And upon receiving a, a notice and a copy of the permit issued by the municipality in the next, which we'll talk about in the next section, um, the Act 250 permit uh, is extinguished. So that's also a, a substantial change here. Okay, so if I had an Act 250 permit and it got extinguished, <clears throat> then I would not have to abide by all the conditions of that permit. Uh, unless it was required by a municipal permit. Correct, we do address that in the next section. Um, okay. The municipal permit is supposed to take on the Act 250 permit conditions unless they're no longer relevant. Okay. Okay, uh, so then we strike language in subdivision V that's related to um, downtown development, positive findings and conclusions. Which is a which is which is in section six thousand eighty six b, which is a current process, an expedited process for downtowns that already exists. Um, but if they're going to be exempt from Act two fifty, we can strike that language. Uh, further, in section seven, we repeal two other sections related to these areas. Um, currently, neighborhood development areas have a reduced fee as an incentive. So we're going to strike that language because they will be exempt. Uh -huh. And um, section 6086B, which I just mentioned related to positive findings and conclusions, that language is also repealed. 
Okay. So then section eight it is in 24 VSA 4460. So appropriate municipal panels. And this is where we're giving, we're turning over the power to the municipality. So um, we're talking about projects that already have an Act 250 permit and are located either in a downtown development district or a neighborhood development area. And they've applied for a permit or permit amendment under this section. So they already have an existing Act 250 permit um, and they're located in an area that is now exempt from Act 250. So the appropriate municipal panel, which is either the planning commission, the board of development review or the zoning board, depending on the municipality, um, they have the power and over these permits and they shall include conditions contained in the original Act 250 permit in the, in the new municipal permit, unless it refers to one of the following things. So the condition should be transferred to the municipal permit unless it relates to the construction phase of the project that's already been constructed, compliance with another state permit that has independent jurisdiction, federal or state law that is no longer in effect or applicable, an issue that is addressed by municipal regulation and the project will meet the municipal standards, or a physical use or condition that is no longer in effect or applicable. So the conditions should be transferred to the new municipal permit unless it refers to one of those. Okay. Uh, the municipality shall provide notice and a copy of the, the permit to the Natural Resources Board. Uh, the municipal panel shall comply with the hearing requirements in 4464 and provide notice um, to the parties under the Act 250 statute in 6084B and reference the existing Act 250 permit. The municipal panel's decision shall be recorded in the land records. And oh, the municipal the municipal panel shall make decisions, shall make a decision and include specific findings with respect to the conditions. And then the final decision shall be recorded in the land records. All right. So Section nine, so um, the following sections relate to downtown development districts and neighborhood development areas. And there was concern that by exempting them from Act 250, there may be a loss of an incentive to develop affordable housing. So a number of these provisions relate to um, making sure that downtown development districts and neighborhood development areas have an affordable housing component. So first we're adding the executive director of VHCB to the downtown development board. And that's the board that approves the applications to be a downtown development district or neighborhood development area. Next in section 10 uh, in the language related to downtown development districts. Uh, we strike the reference to Act 250. And then we add this language in subdivision four and five. And I'm on page 17 for people following along. Subdivision four and five, this language is also added later in the neighborhood development area, but it requires a housing element in the plan um, that achieves the purpose of 4302 and includes clear implementation steps for achieving mixed income housing, including affordable housing, timeline for implementation, responsibility for each implementation step, and potential funding sources. Also, the district shall have adopted one of the following to promote the availability of affordable housing opportunities in the municipality, inclusionary zoning, a restricted housing trust fund with designated revenue streams, a housing commission, 
or an impact fee exemption or reduction for affordable housing. There's your impact fees. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, and so that those two sections um, don't go into effect until July 1, 2022. Um, and that is because some, we, we wanted to give um, some of the districts time to adopt those programs. And there are a number that will come up for renewal or review um, imminently. So we pushed that requirement out until 2022 to give towns time. Uh, next, in section 11, we're in the uh, section related to village centers. And all we're doing here is we're um, streamlining the language to refer that um, a village center designated um, is eligible to receive incentives and benefits, including the downtown and village center tax credit program. And we're not changing any of the language here. We're just condensing it because uh, it was a bit wordy. Uh, next, in section 12, we're in the neighborhood development area section, the requirements for that. So first, so applications for neighborhood development areas have to include the following things. So this first change relates to development in flood hazard areas. Um, so we had extensive discussions about if there should be a greater ability to allow for infill development in the flood hazard areas, in the neighborhood development areas. Um, so the addition of the language here um, allows that neighborhood development areas must exclude areas identified in the flood hazard or fluvial erosion areas, except for those areas containing pre-existing development and areas suitable for infill development as defined in the rules. Um, so there's uh, information about that in the Vermont flood hazard area and river corridor rules. Um, next, they should avoid or minimize to the extent feasible um, areas in the flood hazard area and river corridor. Uh, then on page 21, if the neighborhood development area includes flood hazard areas or river corridors, the local bylaws must contain provisions consistent with ANR's rules to ensure that new infill development within a neighborhood development area occurs outside the floodway, new development is elevated or flood proofed at least two feet above base flood elevation, or otherwise, otherwise reasonably safe from flooding and will not cause or contribute to fluvial erosion hazards within the river corridor. If the neighborhood development area includes flood hazard areas or river corridors, local bylaws shall also contain provisions to protect river corridors outside the neighborhood development area, consistent with ANR's model river corridor bylaws. And Yes, Senator um, Pierre. So I have to jump off for a, a meet or you know a few minutes I have a meeting of four but uh, okay. the, the back to 50 changes here I remember we started talking about this I as I understand it most of these provisions are also part of the larger act 250 bill but it's not the full package and I guess I I have some concerns that that package was a balancing act. And so carving out parts of it uh, ne necessarily doesn't have it in balance. And I just wonder if, if you've had discussions with leadership or if, if that's something, I, I wanna make sure we're aware of that. And, and if anybody has a strategy around that point, I'd be glad to understand it. That's probably a question for the chair of economic development. Yeah, I, I was trying to find out if I was muted or not. Uh, yeah, we talked about that precise point this morning. 
Senator Pearson in economic development. And while uh, um, some of the environmental groups uh, supported these housing provisions and as they related to Act 250, uh, it was in the context of the Act 250 bill moving as well. So your point is well taken and it's things, it's a, something we have to update and look into uh, and see what the likelihood is of that bill passing and whether this in isolation should pass. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And this is Ms. Cochran. If I could add that the language in this bill was um, substantially reviewed and improved by consultation with affordable housing groups. So when those two pieces do come together, this is a more refined version of how um, exemption would occur within these centers to ensure housing affordability is maintained. Okay. Chris, any other question? Chris Pearson, any other questions for you? Not at the moment, and I'll, I'll be here right till four, but- uh, Okay. I'm, I'm gonna have to jump. Okay, in. Ellen, let's- And Madam Chair, just so you know, I have a meeting with the corner office at 4.15. Well, let's move this along then. Ellen, how much further have we got to go here? Uh, we have 11 more pages, but we are through the bulk of it. Okay, so, so let's go through these, because I want to get Chris Corcoran in here too. Sure. Before so, I lose my quorum. Okay. Yep. So okay. we're still in the neighborhood development area. So um, this language on page 22, um, the, the within the development area, the neighborhood development area bylaws allow minimum lot sizes of one quarter acre or less. Uh, we strike the reference to Act 250 at the bottom of the page. And then we can skip a few pages. Um, the language at the bottom of page 24 and onto the page top of page 25 is the same language I mentioned with the um, affordable housing requirement in the downtown development district. Uh, again, it is pushed out until uh, July 1, 2022, so that times, uh, towns have time to adopt those measures. Uh, we strike reference again to the Act 250 district coordinators. Yep, and then we move on to the tax credit section, section 13. So, okay. okay. Yes. So, uh, first, what this does is it extends the downtown and village center tax credit program to include neighborhood development areas. So that's right there at the on line okay. 21. Uh, yes, and then we also on page 30, we add a new type of tax credit um, for qualified flood mitigation projects. So uh, that includes any combination of structural and non-structural changes to a building located within an area subject to the river corridor rule or flood hazard area as mapped by FEMA that reduces or eliminates flood damage to the building or its contents. Um, so that's this is a new type of tax credit. Um, just to flag as a, an issue, so this bill has a lot of moving parts. And in the draft that passed, we actually missed the rest of the language um, that actually authorizes the tax credit. So I have that as an amendment if you would like to pursue this, but it does um, add additional language for this type of project. I, I think we're a long way for we start authorizing foregone revenue this year. And uh, the last I heard, the administration was sweeping all unused revenue just to balance the books this year. I don't know what it's gonna look like next year, but we are definitely in a different fiscal time than when this bill was originally presented to us. So um, we'll have to do what we can to comply with the new reality or 
wait until the reality changes. So we'll see. Okay. All right. So then the last set of changes um, are the section related to wastewater connection permits on page 31. So uh, section 14 and 15 relate to this. Uh, the intent was to reduce the uh, sort of alleged duplicative nature of having both a state wastewater connection permit and a municipal connection permit. Um, I have consulted since with uh, Mike O'Grady in my office and we have some concerns about this language um, and so it may need to be rewritten um, but it was intended to, to reduce duplicative permitting. And then there's a report in section 16 related to um, related to this issue of whether um, to extend it further to have uh, municipalities also have jurisdiction to issue um, permits for subdivisions when the law is served by municipal water and sewer. So that is the those that's the end of my sections. Okay, I think that's the end of walking through the bill. Um, yes. And since we're starting to lose members, I want to get Chris Corcoran up. Chris, you've been here. Are you still here? Where's Chris? Is Chris here? Well, I and see. I can here. see Chris. Yep. He's there. Yep. Oh, there he is. Okay, Chris, the floor is yours. Hey guys, long time. Um, I know everybody's running really soon. So um, in a nutshell, you know, I, I know a lot's changed since we started working on this bill, but we've always had a need for a housing. And what this bill aims to do is align our regulatory programs at the state and local level, um, along with new funding to create new housing opportunities in the right locations. And making these big system-wide changes now will be really important, I think, in the age of COVID as, as we prepare for kind of the next normal of what our communities are going to look like, because it's going to enable our communities to bounce back more quickly. Um, as Ellen explained, you know, it's a pretty holistic package of a lot of different changes that we're talking about. Um, local land use changes, local Act 250 changes, um, changes through state permitting programs to make sure that um, our land use goals are supported. Um, some of the biggest costs in housing are land and infrastructure mm -hmm. and permitting. And so if we can align these programs to get the outcomes that we need, more affordable housing in the right locations, I think we can finally begin to crack this nut. It's been an affordable housing crisis in Vermont since as long as I have been here for 20 years. Um, but I'm, I don't think we've ever really taken kind of a systematic look at this. Um, a lot of this effort was largely informed by work done out west and in the Midwest, you know, looking at how do we make it easier? Pardon? I just, years, years ago, I was on some affordable housing task force at the state and Jesse Ventura was the governor and he did, it was called worker housing, but a very big effort out I think it might have been Michigan um, to do worker housing. And I guess that's my first question is, are we talking affordable as in subsidized or are we talking in affordable as to your teacher, uh, your average worker, your average wage earner in the state could afford the housing? This or are we talking, because uh, we traditionally think of VHFA, we think of housing that's built and then rented and people can't afford the rent it would take to pay the cost, the mortgage basically on the house. Um, we're, I know we've got an income level, but where is that really focusing this housing? 
So some of the some of the provisions in there, um, as far as the funding provisions, they do have targeted income levels. So the program VHIP um, is looking at certain income levels. Um, VHCB funding looks at certain income levels. The tax credits that Ellen talked about are, are not related to income. There's not tied to any specific type of income. Stepping back from the whole thing, we're just trying to create an environment where it's easier to produce housing, where we have sewer and water systems, where we've had made these yes. investments in these areas. That's good. So the bigger framework is really agnostic to affordability. It's just saying these are the right locations to develop housing close to our businesses and our stores and our shops. Let's see what we can do to make this happen by making systematic changes. And then once they're enacted over time, you know, it, it will make Vermont more competitive to many of its other states who are trying to attract new residents, trying to attract visitors to their vital downtowns. So it, it is a big change. It is a lot of change. It's some bold change, but I think it's a change that's necessary and um, made more urgent by the pandemic that we're you know, sorting through now. Um, we want to be ready to that, that create new gets, housing opportunities for that's our community. I've got a question about what we're going to learn from the pandemic, which we won't learn for a while. But um, I guess my concern is, well, A, there can a, a, a municipality zone a large section of open field um, as open space and not permit anything more than like three houses on a hundred acres yeah. and they no, just say this, not that that's ever happened mm -hmm. i the, mean this is walking distance to downtown it meets every definition of smart growth can the town leave that on the books as zoned whatever but essentially non-developable um so what the provisions do if it's a residential area is you have to allow smaller lots if they're served by sewer and water. Now, just allowing them doesn't necessarily mean it will happen. And this was the experience in other states. Oregon enabled ADUs and made more per permissive regulations. And it, it, it wasn't a groundswell of change of, you know, overnight, but it did over time add new units here and there in the right locations. But I could still if I don't want mixed income or lower income housing, walking distance to downtown, you know, sidewalks, the whole, you know, water sewer, it's all there, at least at the road. I could zone that as non-residential open space and not have to comply. Okay, so towns have an out there. The other question was, it's at in doing I think it was a designated neighborhood plan. Mm -hmm. I had to have a certain percentage of affordable housing. Depending on the definition of affordable, because I know we did a calculation in Montpelier just on raw materials and labor charges and, and land and came up with a $300 minimum cost to, 300,000 to put up a house. <coughs> um, raw materials go up, copper, mm -hmm. um, plywood, uh, basic materials. And if I get to, and I've got a developer and they're ready to go and VHCB doesn't have any funds this year, does that stop the whole development? It, it, it's hard to answer that question. Um, you know, more broadly speaking, you know, we can't do much to control the cost of materials uh, or the cost of labor, but what we can do is use our land and resources more efficiently to lower those costs. Um, um, there's not a direct linkage between the neighborhood development area designation program and VHCB, so they're independent. Um, what we're hoping though is, you know, by making it easier to develop in these areas to make smaller units um, um, more easily permitted. On smaller land. With water, wastewater. Right. 
that your $300,000 house can actually be a $250,000 house or less, or it's a multifamily house, which is more efficient. So you get more value out of that same quarter okay. acre, eighth, eighth acre at the end. But I can still require cement sidewalks, granite curbing, open space, all, all of those other nice All the things, things that the municipality wants to have are not gonna be affected by these minimum density requirements. Okay. So I don't have I can say it, need, it needs to look like this. It needs the setbacks need to be like this. A, a lot of those things will still apply. Okay, okay, because those are some of the additional costs. Um, in some places, sidewalks aren't that necessary. I live on a, it's a horseshoe, but it's off a main street. We do not have sidewalks. Uh, they weren't a requirement when this development went in. Um, okay. I think that's so my- I, I could talk more about the section. Yeah. But I think everybody's, everybody's leaving. <laughs> so, um, it's getting but, to that time of day. Some questions? of us have been at this since 9.30 this morning, so. I, I think it's just me, personally. <laughs> no. It, it, it something about a computer screen. It's a long day and there's no breaks. Yes. So I've learned in my my many Zoom times, I just turn off the, the video and it's it's not as exhausting. So that's not that you have that choice, but um, no. Yeah. Chris, could you talk uh, just there's please? McDonald's cat and he hasn't paid us a visit yet today. <laughs> We're meeting many nice pets on Zoom. So, Chris, I just would, uh, because you've been at this for six months or probably almost a year now, can you, you know, this proposal came to our committee as a priority of the administration uh, as a housing, long term housing solution. Can you just tell the committee a little bit about what went into the development? Because I attended a number of meetings and just so many people involved in this process. Yeah, um, it, we started off with um, <clears throat> reading all these articles about what these other more progressive states were doing to solve their housing problems. And we, we convened stakeholders and had series of conversations over the summer. We talked to the League of Cities and Towns. We talked with private housing developers. We talked with affordable housing developers. We talked with, with municipalities. Um, we, you know, the whole package, you know, went through a lot of, um, stakeholder engagement and involvement. Um, there was a big committee meeting that the senator attended in December where everybody kind of added their final comments. So there's a huge group of advocates that do support this bill. Um, so I think it's, I, I think you're gonna hear candidly some concerns from some municipalities um, that I'm maybe sure. don't wanna welcome housing um, and don't wanna um, change anything. Um, and I get that. Um, but I would say for the most part, we, we, we have a lot more supporters than we have detractors. Okay. Becca, do you have your hand up or you? No, okay. No. It was hard for me to hear Chris. I was turning up the volume. Okay, it's hard to tell sometimes. We just see hands moving. All right, any questions for Chris? Okay, committee, I think we're at the end of our tolerance. Thank you, Ellen, you put in the, the bulk today. Thank you, Ellen. Thank um, you. I think the question for me that everything begs is given all of our housing for years has been at promoting greater density and development in downtowns, the virus seems to be most intense in highly dense, highly developed areas. I've heard several people say, oh, well, New York City might start moving up here and we'll get more telecommuters and they might, but I think the question it begs is, are the realtors that are still selling gonna be able to start selling those farmhouses on 50 acres that they haven't been able to sell for a few years because today's generation of home buyers want to live near cities. 
that remains to be seen, but it is definitely a possibility that's out there. And I think we need to keep it in the back of our minds and just monitor, probably monitor home sales. If Marshfield starts to peak and the kingdom starts to peak, then we know that different housing decisions are being made because people are moving more than 15 minutes out from, from population areas. So um, we'll start to start to, uh, yeah, we'll just have to watch it. Okay. Um, we're back to uh, broadband on Tuesday. Then I think we'll take up the nursing compact um, next Thursday and perhaps do some more work on broadband on Thursday. I know a lot of the stuff that's coming in with COVID is very time sensitive. And if we're gonna do anything, um, especially if there is another flare up in the fall and we're back to homeschooling and more telemedicine and closed medical offices, then um, we're gonna wanna have a little more than we've have now in place. So um, I think we might want to start steering the discussion to and what can we do in six months and and how do we do it? And then then we'll go from there. So thank you. It's been a long day. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we will see everybody. Some of you all see tomorrow, some not until Monday or Tuesday. So have a good weekend if I don't see you. Thanks. And may it not snow. Ending live. <laughs>